I'm going to take us through this morning, through a, a run-up to Christmas. We've been going through a few different segments, looking at the whole story of Christmas. Last week, we touched on uh, Jesus in his pre-incarnate appearances. And this week, I want to talk a bit about not the pre-incarnate, the ones before, but the one that was promised. And uh, does any of you have a baby here? Little baby in your hand. I've seen some of you. Little hand baby. Celeste, yeah? Celeste is here with Rowan. And uh, also I know uh, Lenisha and where's, where's, where are you all? Oh, you're right at the back. Baby turned one, right? Hey? On Wednesday, coming up. Your time's flying. Hey? So, uh, Rowan, can I, can I trouble you? Will I embarrass you if I call you up? You're part of my illustration. It's late, huh? It's late. I already called you. I know you'll give your wife a break. Can you come up here, sir? Uh, I, I could have used either one of you, but uh, I think this baby is a little smaller. It's not one year old yet. Uh, there's a reason why. I just want to call him up uh, just to illustrate a point. You can straight up, sir, if you can manage. Uh, Daddy can always manage. She gave me a small smile this morning. And it's part, it's part of... Uh, uh, come a little closer, sir. Now, can I ask you a question, right? It's on the spot. It's to do with my, my preach. Uh, did you know three years ago that this was going to happen? What you're going to own here? And did you have the details? No. No details. None so ever. It just came as this amazing surprise. It happened. And we knew it was going to be a girl. Mm -mm. It's a blessing from God. It's a blessing from God. Do you guys agree that this is a blessing from God? All our babies are, aren't they? Eh? She looks like she wants the mic to say something to me. Eh? Next time, my darling. The picture that I want you to see before you here today. Elira came as this amazing blessing. They got married, and of course, all marriages, we look forward to a child, right? And of course, Elira came along the way, and now their home has changed. But this was not something that he knew, like, in advance. But today, do we have the joy of seeing this? Amazing. Let's give you a big hand. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you, Elira. Thank you, my darling. Okay. So, on my phone, some of you won't see it, but it's a picture of Mary and a little baby. Um, it's Mary and a little baby. And this thing about, if you see in their case, Celeste and Rowan, their baby, Lyra, um, and there could be many of you, none of us knew in advance where things will go. None of us knew in advance what would be the situation, whether we would have children, how many. None of us knew this. And I myself also never knew, even our context, what things, what would work out in the future. We never knew these things. We may have wished for it. We may have hoped one day something would happen. But some of you now, with the luxury of hindsight, you can see what you've got. But we never knew what we were going to get. Am I making sense? But when it comes to Jesus, God already told us in advance, He is coming. For me, that is very fascinating. God told all these people in advance, one day He's coming. And so throughout the dispensations, people would talk about it, they read the prophecy, and Faith read some of my scriptures. She doesn't see my notes. What I do, I do it very privately. She doesn't see what I'm studying, and what I'm going through. And uh, she read the same scriptures, some of which I will share with you now. Uh, but it's talking about prophetic utterances, a word that was spoken in advance, about something that had not tangibly materialized, but was one day coming. It was going to come. 
And so here's this beautiful account about the birth of Jesus that did not just happen, but there was incredible divine orchestration. God had orchestrated every single thing. There's so many little windows that we can look at. I've chosen a couple of them, and we're going to take a look at some of them. Jesus' birth is foretold. And the first one, Isaiah 7.14. If you've got anti-faith scripture, you can pop that up. It's the very same scripture, Isaiah 7 verse 14. It's a famous scripture, especially during Christmas time. We tend to sort of look at it. And I want to just point your attention to this. If you're writing it down, you can go back home and read it at your leisure. But Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel. I want to stop there. There's another one in Isaiah 9 that Faith read earlier. But this is the one that I'm just looking at for now. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel. If we can just hold that post there for a moment, please. Here the scripture is telling us the unique way that this baby is going to come. A virgin shall conceive. That in normal biological understanding, it's not possible. That God chose a surrogate mother, you know, a surrogate mother, a vessel that can be used to incubate divinity in her womb. And give birth to her in a normal, natural way as a human being. Where God, omnipotent, eternal, immutable, unfathomable, unchanging, immeasurable. This God of the past that was always there appearing in little prototypes. This great Jesus was now going to come to planet earth in human form. And God chose... A certain woman, a very specific woman. Unfortunately, in some parts of uh, the world, some parts of Christianity, so to speak, people have deified her. In other words, they have made her a god. But the Bible does not say she was a god but, uh, or anything as divine, but she was a very godly woman. She was an amazing woman. She was a woman, and if I ask any young lady here, young lady, are you listening to me? If God asked you, will you give off your virginity to bring my baby into this world? Will you serve my purposes through your body? That's a huge sacrifice to make. That's a huge sacrifice for somebody to give their body in that way. And Mary did exactly that. She said in the famous words of Mary, Be it unto me according to your word. She offered herself. She probably was about 17 or 18 years of age. And God said, this is what I would want you to do. So firstly we find God sends his son through a virgin. Now you may wonder, or maybe you already know, but I want to explain it so we all understand. You see, Jesus had to be born not through the seed of man. And for all of us, we have to know this. If we don't know this, our fundamental faith is flawed. So I want you to understand something. Whenever a paternity test takes place, what are they testing for? A paternity test from the word pata means father and mata means mother. That's why you have maternal and paternal. So from the paternal test, it's pata. It's the root word says father. When they do a paternity test, they are testing for fatherhood. Who's the father of this child? We're going to do a blood test. And you check the blood out to see who's the father. Jesus was born... By a miraculous inception, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she was found to be with child. She had never been with her 
husband, her engaged husband, she was with Joseph. They were planning to get married. And all of a sudden, Mary is found to be pregnant. That could cause a huge problem in any context. And Joseph also, the Bible tells us the story that he knew that he had never been with her. And he said, I will do a noble thing as a gentleman that I am. I will divorce her quietly, not to disgrace her. But the angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph said, Joseph, that which this Mary is carrying is of mine. It's divine. Do not put her away. And there too, Joseph had to do a huge thing. He had to father another person's child. In this case, it was God's child. And he had to make himself available to look after someone else. We take our hats off to people who do these kind of things in the name of love. That goes beyond themselves. God bless you. God bless you when you've loved without reservation. When at times you didn't have to. But here's Joseph. He, will, he willingly you know, complies with God's plan. And of course Mary now is found with child. And there's this amazing thing that's happening. People have to make themselves available. You see, friends, that is why I want to just leave this thought with you. This almighty God, he could use any channel. But I love when God always, he tends to use just people like you and I. He uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Never ever feel God can't use you. If you're willing, if you're available, and if you say, Lord, here I am, use me, God can use you. And you can see how God used Mary, how God used Joseph. And you and I could be a Mary or a Joseph in God's master plans. Never ever say, me, no way God can use me. But God could. And God wants to. But God will not in any way impose himself on you. We must make ourselves available. So the Christmas story has got a lot to do with that. But let's get back to virgin birth, paternity test. Do you know from the first day when Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right from the beginning, the cradle of mankind, when Adam sinned, God says, Adam, the day you disobey me, you will surely die. Adam died at 960 years of age. 960. His grandchildren must have been about 400 and 500 years old. That's the dispensation they lived in. And they eventually died. The ages started to go lower and lower. And I think Methuselah was 969. And I think Adam was 960. Yes, thereabouts. There was another at 937. But it was in the 900s. And then people started to slowly fade away to the six, fives and threes and hundreds. That's the decline. It says your body could not continue. The day you sin, you will surely die. Now you see, in Adam's veins, the blood that flows is already sin. It's got sin in it. Every man that's born in his veins is the passing on. Like one father to the next child, you're passing the bloodline. You're passing the bloodline. That's why they do paternity tests. You're seeing fatherhood and it's the passing of the bloodline. That's where the sin is. That is why when it comes to our children, as I sometimes teasingly say, you don't teach a child how to be naughty. You have to teach a child how to be good because inherently in us, we by our birth, we are naturally evildoers. We're quick to do wrong things. But to do good, it needs to be trained. You need to discipline yourself. In the same way you go in your backyard in the garden, you don't have to go to McDonald's or anywhere to buy seeds to plant weeds. Even some other weeds that you never planted, they grow as well. I got a few around my neighborhood, they're wondering if I'm running a plantation. You know what I'm talking about. But again, if you want roses, if you want beautiful flowers, Ask the people who look after gardens. You'll find out. It takes effort. 
It takes extra effort. It costs you something. And in the same way in our behavior, in our lifestyle, to have weeds all over us is easy. But to have roses in us takes effort. Therefore, in our veins, it flows that, that, uh, that inclination, that leaning to do wrong things. The quick, fast, like by nature, our Adamic nature, our old nature, it's quick to just do wrong things. It's to curse and, and to, to do wrong stuff and, you know, just get like in the flesh. If you are not in Christ, you easily live there all your life. But when you are in Jesus, you die to the flesh and you put on a new man and you start to live like Paul says, anyone who is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Jesus Christ almost does like a blood transfusion in us. He kicks out Adamic blood. He brings his royal blood in us. And all of a sudden we start behaving so different. And people say, hey, this guy looks so good. No, it's, it's not because I'm good. It's that I'm having more of Jesus in me and less of Adam in me. And every day I become better and better and better. So you see, why was Jesus needing to be born of a virgin? Where he must not have the bloodline of a normal earthly man. Because if Jesus' father fathered him like Joseph fathered him, then Jesus would be born as a sinner. But when Jesus was born, he was not a sinner. There was no sin in his veins because his father was God. God Almighty impregnated by the Holy Spirit with a divine seed. So that Mary, when she gave birth, she gave birth to the second Adam. The perfect human being after Adam. Adam was born perfect. God created him perfect. There was not a flaw on him until he disobeyed. And then Jesus was born perfect. And he also had to go through the test whether he's going to obey or disobey. And even Satan came in and tempted him. Matthew chapter 4, we read about that. And tempted Jesus to go off the path. But it says every time the devil tried to tempt him, Jesus had a verse of scripture for him. It is written, you will not tempt. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And he got the devil off his back. And finally, at the last straw, when it was like everything was falling on, on top of him, he was having a real torrentially painful time. Jesus was buckled low and profusely bleeding through the sweat pores on his face as he wrestled with this thing about going to Calvary and to die. And he said, Father, is there another way? This is so hard to do, Father. Is there any other way? And heaven was silent. And so Jesus gets up and he says, Father, nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. Not my will, but your will. Compared to Adam, Adam said, well, my wife is offering me this fruit. Well, I'm going to do it. God says don't, but I'll say I can. The moment you do that, you walk out of God's covering. But the moment you stay fixated on God and you say, God, no matter how difficult this is, this thing will kill me and it will. Jesus said, not my will, Father, but your will. The second Adam never failed. The first Adam did. This child that was born on Bethlehem's manger was perfect and he never failed. He never failed. He went to the cross and his last words on the cross was, It is finished. Perfectly done. What I came to do, mission accomplished. It is done. Friends, I want to I wanna encourage you here today. What Jesus did for us on that cross, from the time of the cradle to the time of the cross, it was perfection. The Lord did it all because he loved you and me. The scripture says that he was born of a virgin. So when you look at that, people argue that, they dispute that, say no, it can never be. Because if they attack that and they win, which they can't, because it's, it, is, it is too much of evidence to prove to the, to the contrary that Jesus actually did come and was born 
of a virgin, you will find that this Jesus was the only person who can say to another human being, I forgive you. You see, if I'm a sinner myself, I can't forgive you for all your wrongs because I myself am a sinner. I can pardon you. Yes, we can forgive each other for you know, misunderstandings and so on. But I can't pardon you for all the wrong. That is why I cannot go to another man, a human being and says, please, will you pray for me that God must rid me of all my sins? Can you pardon me for my sins? You can't because we're not God. Let me give you this closing story and I'll move to point number two. Remember the time when the lady who was caught in the act of adultery and they all dragged her across and threw her there in front of Jesus and said, Jesus, this woman, we caught her in the act of adultery. Now, according to Moses' law, we must take stones and take her outside the city and we must beat her till she dies. And they had their stones in their hand. You know what? It's funny, eh? The world is full of stone throwers. You don't have to go too far. There's people always got a stone to throw on somebody, to pick on somebody, to bring them down, to hurt them. Stone carriers. And there's they, these guys are standing before Jesus, and then Jesus looks at them. He can see they're, they're very angry, and he looks at them and he says, I want to ask you a question. If there's any one of you here today who has not done anything wrong in his life, you be the first one to throw the stone. And then he put his head down and he started right in the sand. And then he lifted up his head and there was a pile of stones on the ground, but no people. They all were gone. They couldn't throw the stone because Jesus said, if you had never done wrong, and they all knew, we all have done wrong. So they threw their stones and they, and they left. And then this, Jesus looked at the woman and said, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, Lord, there is no one. The only one who can condemn her was Jesus. Because he never do a single thing wrong. And you know what Jesus says to her? Well, neither do I condemn you. The one who is qualified to condemn you reserves that privilege to say, I won't. But go and sin no more. You see, friends, we serve an amazing king. We serve an amazing savior. And I want to encourage you to be reminded about that. It says, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. You shall call his name Emmanuel. Man Emmanuel interpreted means God with us. God with us. This little baby born in that manger was very God with us. That's quite a huge thing. Quite a huge thing where you have this incarnating, where God becomes a, a piece of human flesh. Now, like I was mentioning to Rowan regarding his baby, and that applies to all of us with all our future, because we, we don't know what our future is like. We all trust for the best. Um, but this particular prophecy was written in Isaiah 7.14. It was written approximately 700 years beforehand. Now, all of you that are sitting here, I want you to do a small exercise. I want you to think back about your father or mother or think back to your grandparents if you can remember that. And if any of you here can remember great-grandparents, how many years will that go back? Each generation is approximately 70 years nowadays. Approximately 70. And if you go three levels of 70, that's 2,100 years. Uh, sorry? Thank you. You're right. I knew that was horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah, 210. And if you, when you look at that, that's like 200. Let's go 250 years. If you can think that far back. Some people are married 53 years. Wow. Yeah, that's a lifetime for some people, eh? And so you go to like, say, 250 years. That's as far back as you can remember. 
Most children don't know who their grandfather is or their great-grandfather was. Uh, and many of us never had photos in the old days of some of our older folks. So nowadays, I know selfies and all that, there's so much of photos. You'll be able to show your great-grandchildren lots of photos of how good you used to look. But those days, they were very limited. So he had no memories, nothing to like hold on to. But here, the Bible says, 700 years. It was spoken and they were waiting and they said, is it going to be this season? Is it going to be this generation? No. And finally it came to Mary and Joseph's generation. That's a whole fascinating account. Then Faith read this one about Micah. The book of Micah 5 verse 2. Um, we read that a little while ago. The prophet Micah, is a, it's one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. And he wrote there about Bethlehem Ephrata. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. We know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And if you don't know your Bible, just go and listen to Boney M's song. Long time ago in Bethlehem. So the Holy Bible says. You got that? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It was a little, small town. Insignificant place. I want to say to you, sometime God, in his incredible wisdom, he uses the most unthought of place, or people, or situation, to show his incredible glory. How many times have we seen that? People say, can any good thing come out from that place? Yes, and God surprises the world. Good things have come out. And uh, I come out from nine and three. <laughs> and everybody was talking in the old days. Ooh, that place. Ay, 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 ay. But there's a lot of good things that have happened. And not just, you know, I mean... God has used lots of amazing people to do great things, not just preaching or, or whatever. There's other things that people have been a blessing. All is not bad. God can use the written one, the people that are written off for his glory. Never ever count yourself off, ma'am, sir. If you've got it all, what can God give you? But if you've got nothing to show, God can come up and do some amazing things and you'll see the world will stand back and say that this has to be God. You know, this has to be God. So bless you as you keep pressing in. In the, in the prophecy of Micah, it was written about, again now, 800 years before. 800 years before uh, the coming of Jesus. That word, Bethlehem, does any of you know what it generally stands for? Bethlehem stands for house of bread. House of bread. That's what Bethlehem stands for. It's a house of bread. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, is it not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven? But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always could you give us this bread? Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. John chapter 6 from verse 32 onwards. Jesus here, born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, being presented as the manna from heaven, now the ultimate bread that has come from God, and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You know, friends, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. You know, bread, <coughs> excuse me, you know, bread uh, is basically everybody's staple food. You may not have bakers, bakers all sorts, but if you've got bread, every home must have bread. Every home must have bread. 
Even the Lord's prayer says, give us this day, our daily bread. And when you go to India, you watch how the aunties wake up in the morning and they get that stove operating and then the chapatis are coming out hot. We have it for breakfast. It's amazing. They don't have Albany there. Uh, I think they do have some places now, the kind of bread what you and I have, but the traditional Indian bread, the chapatis, they cook them right there, and until you watch after a while, they're all out there, you're having hot bread, so, so amazing when you have hot bread. So this thing about bread, it is not necessarily a delicacy, but it's a fundamental thing that we all need. It's your basic thing to sustain you. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of heaven, it means if you've got nothing else, but you have him, you've got everything. You may not have all the fancy stuff, but if you've got Jesus, you've got everything you'll ever need. Okay, it's good to have a bit of jam, and the jam will come. Jesus said, when you pray, pray, Father, give us this day our daily bread. But yes, God also surprises us. He gives us some peanut butter. He gives you a bit of mutton curry. You know, it gets, it gets, it gets like that with God. But never forget what is the main thing you need in your life. The bread to sustain you. Okay, some of you on diet, I know you're keeping away from bread. <laughs> eh? Is that correct? Yeah. But there we go. You will never be hungry if you have the bread. So in other words, Jesus must be the core ingredient that we will ever need to keep us going. Lastly, Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. If you're writing scriptures down, Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. And when Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son. That's an amazing prophecy by the prophet Hosea. As I was saying earlier, today's message is about the foretelling, the prophetic foretelling about that which was to come. Now, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That was a prophetic word. Oh, there we go. We can maybe just follow. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to Baal and burnt incense to their images. Now, I want to... Is that Hosea 11, 1? Yeah, that's 2. Could we maybe find verse 1 and see if we can, if it's possible? Yeah, there you go. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. We can just freeze that for a moment. This year, this prophecy was written by, uh, by Hosea again, approximately 800 years prior, and before Christ was born. And this verse looks in two ways. This verse looks in two ways. It looks backwards, history, and it looks forward, prophecy. Backward, it talks to us about when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Remember, they were slaves. As a nation, God called his son out, the nation of Israel. He called them out from slavery, and he took them away. But also, he spoke about futuristically. Remember when Jesus had to flee. Jesus had to flee because there was a decree sent out by the current authority, Caesar Augustus. And there was all this, uh, this, 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 uh, this like intimidation. You know where it all started. I'll tell you where. When the wise men did not act very wise, that's where it started. The wise men were following the star all the way from the east. And as they came to Jerusalem, they arrived. You know, like when you arrived, they said, hey, we're coming to look for this king. They've been traveling from far. And as they arrived to this big metropolis of, Ju of Jerusalem, there's a palace there. They said, where, where are kings born? Kings are born in fancy places like this, an edifice called the palace. And so they stopped following the star and they follow their human intellect. <clears throat> Excuse me. In following their human intellect, they get themselves there to where the palace was. They used human reason. You know, sometimes we are wise and we can be very wise. Some of us, we follow the Lord, that's wise. And, and uh, you probably know this wise men still seek him. Don't stop seeking the Lord. <clears throat> I need some of that water, please, baby.
You know, just as I'm going to close now, I just want to close with this last point. Thank you for the water break. Uh, the wise men, as they approached Jerusalem, they left following the star and they just went to the palace. I want to maybe caution us, no matter how intellectually astute we can be, no matter how proficient we can be as thinkers and whatever, career people, some of us are smarter than others, bless you. Um, but may we never ever get so wise that we don't need God to guide us anymore. May we never get that wise. Because they left following the star and they go to the king. Hello king, we are from the east. We came to find out where is the king that's going to be born. And of course it was news to him. Now if you know anything about territorial people, creatures, this is my territory. Who, who's this new king now? And you know, as a true politician that this king must have been, you know all the politicians when they smile, they're not really smiling, you know that? They're grinding their teeth. The true politicians. They, they're never truthful. They're smiling, but they're angry, actually angry. And this man was saying to them, come have something to eat, come here. Where, where is this king? Tell us a bit more. So, you know, we also want to come and worship him. Where is he? And of course, they didn't know because they were also lost themselves. They were trying to find. And as they walked out, they saw the star still up there. And they followed the star, took them to Bethlehem. They got there to Bethlehem. And they saw the star. And it came and stood over the house where Mary and Joseph was. But the king was already tipped off. That there is another king that's being born. And so he made out a decree. All boys under the age of two. Because that was how far back they traced when this thing could have happened. We want, he sent out a decree that all boys born and Jewish families, Jewish family, go and kill them. Quite a painful thing, isn't it? And they went out on this massive butchering, hunting and killing. And they were, they were basically killing all male boys born two years and under. Exactly the same thing happened during Moses' time. When Moses was born. Same sort of scenario. And of course, when Joseph heard this, the angel of the Lord said, Joseph, pack your wife, take a picnic basket, get a few things in a hurry and shoot to Egypt to go and hide there. That's what this verse was talking about. I will bring my son out of Egypt. And so when I, when I looked at that verse, it reminded us about that account was prophesied in advance that Jesus will go and, and so many years later 800 years later this thing all materialized. Isn't that fascinating? That is so fascinating that after 800 years this prophecy came to pass. Joseph went off to Egypt stayed for a little while all the drama subsided they said okay you can take your boy back now it's, it's safe to go back and that's when Jesus came back when Jesus returned, he did not go to Bethlehem because he couldn't stay there. He moved to a place called Nazareth. And his little boyish days growing up, he was known as Jesus of Nazareth. That's how he got that name, Jesus of Nazareth. Are you Jesus of Nazareth? Yes. That's how they associated him to the place where he grew up. Jesus of Nazareth. That's where he stayed in his childhood days. So today, I want to just leave these thoughts with you here. And I look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, if you're making notes. That's where the New Testament um, fulfillment of that prophecy comes to pass in that early verse there of the 14 and 15 verse chapter 2. When I, when I close now, I want to leave this with you. When I brought Rowan up with his little baby... And I was saying, we don't know what our future is. I want to land this with you. Just like how Jesus had a prophetic word over his life of something that was to come. It may not happen now. It may not happen then. It will happen in God's perfect time. Over every one of you in this building today, I want to submit that God has a prophetic plan for your life. Just like he had for Jesus. And just like Jesus was born in God's perfect time, I want to say to you, don't give up 
on God's prophetic words over your life. God has prophetic words spoken over you. Don't give up. I got one of my old Bibles that uh, one of the guys that was with us, Pramod Governor, some of you were with us way back. You might remember him. Um, they're living in New Zealand in Tokoroa at the moment. He gave me a gift. He gave me a study Bible before they immigrated. Years ago. It's all tattered now. And on the fly leaf of that page, I, I wrote a prophetic word that was given to me by late Goni Naidu. Some of you know Goni Naidu. They used to be at the old Patmos church. And he got shot and he got blind. But he was a dear friend of mine. And we used to run youth groups and all together way back. Uh, 40, well, 35 years ago. And uh, Goni came one day and he made a prophetic word over me. I wrote it on the fly leaf of my Bible. And it still talks to me till today about God's call on your life. And I never knew a thing about it. It didn't even make sense to me way back. But then in time, God makes it happen. None of us are good in ourselves, people. Only God is good. But God has a different plan for you, ma'am. Different plan for you, sir. Mom, dad, God has a plan for you. Always say, God, what is your plan for my life? Am I just supposed to go to work, make money, buy food, eat, and, and wait for next year? And is there things that I'm supposed to also be doing? As a kingdom ambassador, a representative of Jesus on this earth. So when I die, I'm in front of the church in a horizontal position. Can I say, I finished my job? Or are you going to say, I, I, I just passed my time and waited till, die, till I die? I, I don't believe God has that for you. Sir, ma'am, wherever you are, I speak to you. I call you in the name of Jesus. And I say, stop resisting God's prophetic destiny for your life. Don't try to abandon or disregard God's call on your life. God didn't just save you, clean you up and get you ready for heaven. God wants you to impact your community, change your world. Do something that will say, this world will never be the same again because of so and so. You be a blessing, even if it's one person you touch. Be a blessing. You may touch one person. You may touch a whole community of people. You may touch your neighborhood. You may touch the people you work with. You don't know people are watching you. But you can shine for Jesus. Because I can't be where maybe you can be. Of course I can't be. So I want to encourage you. Please, dear brothers and sisters, family of God. God has a word over your life. On the other hand, I want to throw a warning. I want to throw a warning Stop going around looking for another prophecy over your life. I know there are places where people go around, please, I, I heard you're a prophet. Can you please give me a prophetic word? Bring this Bible here, please, Faith. Thank you, Faith. You want a prophetic word? Go read it. You want a prophetic word? Go read what the word says about us. Some of us are looking to be tickled and to be encouraged. I, I, I believe in prophetic words. I, I, I'm not discounting it. But I'm saying don't become a, a prophetic word binger. Running to the next conference so I can get a prophetic word. And a, I just need to fall here today. Just touch me lightly. Stop being a prophetic binger. Looking for another nice word. Take the word that God's spoken about you. Like the word God says. He's, you read, yeah, there's prophetic words over you and I as God's children. Take it and say, you have blessed me, Lord, in ways I can never measure. And then as you go out, say, Lord, wherever you place me, I want to impact my world. I want to be a blessing wherever I go. And as you do that, ma'am, sir, this world will never be the same again. God bless you. I want you to search in your heart today and say, is the devil trying to kill the prophecy? You know, there's Herods around there. They want to kill the prophecy. They don't want it to come to pass. They wanted to kill the Moses. They wanted to kill the Jesus. The devil also wants to kill you. The devil, don't play by the book, sir. 
He is a dirty player. He wants to take you out. He bluffs you that things are nice outside. And once he's got you on his side, he takes you out. He takes me out. The devil is there to do that. But I want to encourage you by God's word. God has, like Jesus, he has a good prophetic plan for your life. My prayer is that you will find it, that you will live it, and you'll die satisfied. And say, God, it was a blessing to live for you here on earth, and now I'm going to be eternally with you forever, ever, and a day. I'm going to be with God. God bless you. I pray you feel encouraged. I pray that you feel stirred in your heart. None of us are here by accident. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for me. May we find it, and may we live it, and may the prophecy be like how your brain has said in the Ten Commandments. So let it be written. So let it be done. May that be over you. I speak that over you. I pray that whatever God's written about you, it will happen. The devil will not take us out. We will not be a statistic. We will not be a has-been. We will not be I wish I could. We will be it in the name of Jesus. Like Jesus, in the fullness of time, God sent his time. He sent his son. In the fullness of time, God will send you man. God will send you woman of God, young man, young lady. In the fullness of time. In other words, in the maturing time of God, God will send you. So wherever you are, say, Lord Jesus, I'm not waiting for the 31st of December to think about what I'm going to do for next year. I'm starting from now. Getting my heart keyed in on this last Sunday morning service of 2023. The Lord bless you all. Would you bow with me please for a moment? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us, speaking to me. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, that our lives are not accidents. Like we see little babies that we see before us here today. Lord, there's a plan for every little life that comes into this world. And Lord, we know the devil wants to rob us of achieving the plan of God, the prophetic destiny of our life. But Lord, we pray right now, this morning, I pray for this house. I pray for all your people in this house and outside of this house. Lord, I pray that you will cause us to be people that will see the prophetic word of God come to pass. Lord, your words are A and Amen. What your word has spoken, it will not fall to the ground. And so, gracious Father, we bless you. We thank you for every life. We thank you for what your children are currently involved in. We thank you for the joy that you give us because we're involved in whatever we do. And I pray, Father, there'll be all of us that will see, grab a hold of your prophetic word in our life, and that we will live according to what you have designed for us. May we never settle, O oh God, for mediocrity. May we never settle for second best. Because you have only the best for us. Your word teaches us, for I have good plans for you. Plans to bless you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Lord, I pray those plans for all your people. I pray that you will help us make good of it as we do this. And thank you for Jesus that was born. Thank you that we have hope. Because of this sinless Savior that has the power to forgive sins today. And if any of us have failed, have sinned, fallen short, thank you. You're by your blood, we are cleansed. And you make us every wood whole. Lord, as we leave today, I pray that you will grant your grace upon our life. That we will go out there and we will be a world changer. Because Jesus changed our world. We give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.